Hi. NSU, Norfolk State University, class of 2020. I'm excited, but I first got to tell you guys, look, um, this, is hap this is obviously happening remotely, so I'm, I may mispronounce a couple names, um, but I'm, we're going to get through this. You know, there's so much going on in the world right now, but we are going to get through this. I'm excited, though. This is Norfolk State University. This is the class of 2020. Um, I first want to say hello to everybody. Um, hello to the graduates. Um, I'm honored to be a part of your graduation ceremony. Um, and even if this is not the norm, you guys and girls still deserve all the praise. You deserve the praise. You stuck it through. You made it. And today's your day. And man, you made it at a really crazy time in life, man, in America, in the world, right? I mean, this is a historic year. So I congratulate you all. I'm very grateful that you've allowed me to share one of the most special days in your life um, and, and in my life too. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Adams Gaston, the administration and faculty. Like I said, if I mess some names up, forgive me. My heart is in the right place. Um, but look, I, I got some things to say. Uh, let me start by saying that like, I did not have the opportunity and the privilege to attend Norfolk State, but Norfolk State played a big role in my life. And let me explain, when I was a kid, I was in band, I love music. Um, but my older brother, it was my older brother who would always talk about the Booker T. Washington High School marching band. Um, and he was in another school, but we loved that band. And we always talked about how they looked up to Norfolk State. Um, and according to my brother, like everyone looked up to Norfolk State. And I understood why once I seen him because he would say, man, you know, the way that they high step, you know, and once I saw that, like that's an arresting feeling to see all those amazing people, beautiful people just stepping in beat, um, choreographed and playing like the songs of late at that time. That was a crazy feeling. Um, and that motivated me in a, in a crazy, crazy way. So to be able to come and speak um, to this incredible institution that contributed to my love of music and to also know that Norfolk State was gonna perform at the Something in the Water uh, Festival representing the 757, our MSA, is like, that would have been like closing my eyes and seeing my childhood dreams really actually come full circle. So I also wanna say thank you to William Bethia, I hope I said that right, uh, for all your help this year and we'll definitely be back. Um, but yeah, man, behold, the green and the gold. Behold the green and the gold. When you would hear that, that is when you saw uniforms, uh, energy, bodies, and heard amazing music. Um, the color guard. I mean, thank you for the continuous memories. Um, but right now, yeah, we'd love to be, you know, we'd love to be, you know, watching the game or at the halftime, but we're all home. We're sitting home. You know, I'm at home, you're at home. It might not be ideal. Life almost never is. But I think that that's what makes it special. And that's how memories are created. I believe we need moments of just, dis you know, disruption to open our eyes and gain new levels of self-awareness. And I know it's easy to say that Today we've been uh, connected by technology, which is true, but, but I hope you realize that like we're connected by some, like something much more, energy. And when you think about it from the school point of view, yeah, you, you're like, okay, yeah, that's school pride, you know, your school morality and your ethics codes and stuff. But I'm talking about something bigger than that. I'm talking about the higher, po higher power energy. We're connected by that, you know? And 
I think that is what we gotta, we, what we have to remember when these times try us like this. We have to remember that we're bound by a stronger, higher power. Allow me to channel that energy that is amongst us. Um, so I've established the fact that I, you know, Norfolk State is a huge part of my story, but today is about your story. Today, you guys graduate, you guys and girls, you graduate from college. That's huge. And it's not the beginning or the end of your story. It's just that we're all simply ending one chapter and starting another. I know that Norfolk State has filled you with the ink and giving you the tools necessary to write any story you can imagine. But we're talking about your story right now. In fact, the most important thing for you to remember with that is that it's not your story alone. Um, the story that you're writing right now, the world that you're creating is part of a larger story. It's the continuation of the story of black people in this country, African diaspora. It's a story that we're writing together as black people and people of color. When Harriet Tubman was huddled in the mud, she was holding her breath, her breath hoping you could one day continue her story. Martin Luther King dreamed of chapters that you're about to write. Muhammad Ali, uh, Malcolm X, Barack Obama, your mother, your father. My brother's boasting of the high-stepping uh, band in green and gold. You know, those are not a bunch of disconnected, desperate anecdotes. It's all the same story. It all belongs to us. At the core of your story is a belief in yourself, or else there's no story. So believing in yourself is essential. And I can hear you groaning in front of your laptop like, oh man, you know, he's about to go into some trite graduation speech about believing in yourself and you can do anything you put your mind to. And you, I know you know that. I'm sure you heard that a million times from a million different people. And yes, it's completely true. But what I'm trying to explain is that a belief in yourself is actually a belief in us. Think about all the story writers that came before you. Think of those who yet to hold a, a pen in their hands yet. Now think of all those people that have tried to take our story away from us. Imagine the uncountable number of persecutors and oppressors and powers that be that tried to silence our songs, steal our story, rip pages, rip the pages out of our books. But then remember this, every single one of them failed. Every single one of them failed. And that's why it should be easy to believe in yourself, to believe in us. As African-Americans and African diaspora, I know it sometimes feel like they're winning. And if I'm honest, sometimes it feels like we're this close, like this close to being shut down or having our story shut down. Even when we were free from bondage, we the subject to the whims of the men who previously believed we were their property. We want our humanity, our right. We want our humanity, but then our right to vote was stolen. And we want our right to vote once we Excuse me, once we won our right to vote, it was still taxed and suppressed. And when we made it to the voting booth, the electoral college and the ever expanding <laughs> continuous gerrymandering made sure that our votes didn't count as much. These are just a few examples. Our story is nothing if not a never ending struggle for equality and freedom. That's all oppressed people, not just people of color. And yet, we remain. We're here. We remain. But remember when I said that these moments of disruption help us gain new levels of self-awareness? Right now, I see a lot of people trying to tell our stories. I'm sure you see it too. Right now, you know, I'm sure you're seeing it. There are like high-ranking public officials trying to tell our stories, saying that we don't care about our health. They suggest that you, me, black people, people of color, don't care enough to take care of ourselves. 
And because of that, we're most likely than anyone else to fall victim to this pandemic. They stand at podiums with the whole world watching saying that we, you and me, are to blame. Conveniently, forgetting of hundreds of years of subpar treatment, subpar treatment, sub, subpar treatment, forgetting hundreds of years of slavery, forgetting decades of inequality, Jim Crow, and the lasting legacy of the three-fifths compromise. Remember that subword, subpar, subhuman? Three-fifths compromise and the electoral college. They forget that judges sentence black people to 20% longer sentences than a white person convicted of the same crime. My children. They forget that living in, the, in, in a black neighborhood means you receive a 10% higher bail. They forget that blacks and whites use drugs at the same rate, but black people are arrested for drugs at three times the rates of whites. They forget that a black person earns 87 cents for every dollar an equally educated white person earns. They forget that health, health insurance is tied to unemployment. Excuse me. They forget that health insurance is tied to employment and that black unemployment rate has been twice the unemployment, white un unemployment rate since the day our country began recording that statistic. They forget that a black person is twice as likely to live in a zip code without a primary care physician. Can you imagine that? Many of us have experienced that. They have conveniently forgotten that the highest COVID-19 death rate just happens to be in the same tiny Louisiana County as the, re as, as the highest cancer rate. And it just so happens to be the one that has the most contaminated air in America. And St. John's, the Baptist parish, Louisiana, just happens to be majority black. Maybe they forgot that. Maybe they aren't aware that the average black child in America inhales. Their lungs literally do not get as, as much oxygen as white children. And I'll tell you why, because black children are more likely to have asthma and in black neighborhoods that have more air pollution. These things about us are all observable facts and they're not to be forgotten actually. And it's not your fault and it's not my fault. Somehow forgetting all these things, they want to tell the story that black people don't care about our survival. Clearly we're here, clearly we survive, so clearly we do. We've proven time and time again that we're survivors. You know, one of the, the, the characteristics that most all living creatures have, especially humans, and that they share, that desire is to, is, is to live and survive. Even though history has proven that we are better at surviving than anyone else on earth, this pandemic has exposed the lengths that certain people will go to dehumanize us and reinforce that we are subhuman. So we have to take ownership of our story. And for those that have been doing it, we got to continue to do it, we continue doing that. I'm not telling you to, just, to, to, I'm not telling you guys and girls this to bring you down and the alumni to bring you down. I'm just offering some story suggestions. We're all born activists. We're all born uh, observers and we all appreciate facts. But I want to take this opportunity to channel this incredible power of your generation and remind you that while you're embarking on your careers as engineers, marketers, and scientists, and all the beautiful, amazing um, programs and education that NSU offers, that you remember that you are also naturally authors of the black story. You are naturally authors of the American story. And when you look at the stars at night, you, can, you, you know that like you're, you're looking at the past, you're looking at the present and you're looking at the future. So they can 
wrestle with us about our past. You can wrestle with us about black history, but the future is non-negotiable. We need to drive the narrative. Let's work off facts, not opinions and judgments. We, we live where people are disproportionately affected by years of oppression. And people are gonna try to spin it. They do it all the time. They're gonna spin it. You see it, but it doesn't work on you. And it's not working on me. But again, that word story, let me tell you a story that no one really talks about. And it actually involves a pandemic from before. Beginning in 1916, the polio virus began ravaging the world for 40 years. In America, polio killed thousands of children. And I'm sure as you know, a scientist named Jonas Salk created the first polio vaccine and cured the world. It's a beautiful story, except it's not the full story. You see, polo crippled so many children in the U.S. that in 1937, our president at the time got involved. He formed what was called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis and convinced the biggest celebrities in America to help raise funds. They asked everyone in America could, to contribute 10 cents to the foundation and it raised millions. But there was one problem. They forgot about the black kids. They forgot about our black children. Most people, even the doctors at that time, believed that black children were immune from polio because they were too primitive. Facts, please look it up. And because medic medicine was segregated, like everything else at that time, this organization just ignored black children with polio even though they were getting it at disproportionate rates in some cities. Sound familiar? So, black college students and activists, just like you, got fed up with the medical community back then, ignoring polio in black communities. So they went and they, they went to war against the foundation and black people stopped sending in their 10 cents, 10 cents. When the funds started to drop, the charity agreed to include black kids on their posters and gave $161,000 to build a center for black polio victims at Tuskegee University. Of course, Tuskegee had all the best black, the best black doctors in the world. Even after a vaccine was actually developed, there was a struggle to mass produce it. So Jonas Salk himself couldn't figure it out. But H.M. Henderson and Russell Brown, two black doctors at Tuskegee, told the white doctors, give us a sample and let us see what we can do. But see, a year before Salk had created his vaccine, a black woman who was originally from Virginia died from cervical cancer, sadly. When the doctors harvested her cells without her consent, they discovered that her cells just wouldn't die. So these two black doctors in Tuskegee got samples of the black woman's immortal cells and mass produced them for the entire country actually. They not only figured out how to reproduce the cultures though, they figured out how to package and ship them. And in three years, they reproduced 600,000 cultures for the polio vaccine. And in just seven years, the number of polio cases in the US fell from 35,000 to 161. Remember that $161,000? Interesting, right? Only two of the cases out of that 161, sorry, were black children. Only two of the cases were black children. So H.M. Henderson, Russell Brown, and Henrietta Lacks, the woman, the black woman with the first immortalized cell line happens, who again happens to be from Virginia, they were an integral part of saving America. But their story is rarely ever told. You're more likely to hear the name of the National Foundation for the Infantile Paralysis, for Infantile Paralysis, excuse me. The group that initially ignored us 
you're more than like you're more than likely to hear those names than the names of the black people who actually helped cure the pandemic. And it was a global pandemic. And while you might not know the names of these life-saving African Americans, you'll likely have heard of the organization and its popular name, the March of Dimes. See, that's why we need to write our own stories. Immortality is, immortality is in our DNA. We've always been unstoppable. And that's why um, it's important for you to believe in yourselves, for us to believe in ourselves and for us to believe in our story. We gotta, no one's gonna save us. We have to do this as we have before. And thank you for bearing with me. But again, you are, you are our hope. You are the, 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 the hope that this country has. You are the next chapter, chapter of innovators. You are the problem solvers. When others try to tell our story, they might rewrite it. They might even try to take credit. But while they are marching, we are high stepping. And what takes them millions of dollars, we can do with a dime. We've done it before. We're gonna do it again. This is our story. This is the real American story. This is the, this is, this is, this is the American story, man. We know we were there. We survived it. We continue to survive it. And because of that, we have a story. So I know you're sick of hearing that word today, but trust me, it's important that we, we channel this energy because it's beautiful just like you. This has been an absolute honor and a total highlight. And even when like, even when we elevate ourselves and lift each other, like there'll be, well, there'll be advocates, there'll be allies and we can hold hands, it's all good. And there's also gonna be haters. And when they can't take it, sometimes they're going like, close their eyes and not gonna wanna see it, but it's okay. They ain't gonna be able to help themselves. They'll peek and squint and when they do, we'll say behold, it's the green and the gold. Thank you for everything. And you guys have a blessed day, a blessed year, and go change the world. See you in the 757. Love. Thank you, Pharrell. Congratulations again on your accomplishment, Spartans. I know that you will do well, and we can't wait to see what you will achieve on the road ahead. Behold the green and gold.